On behalf of the PetBond system, welcome to today's webinar. We're glad you joined us. I wanted to point out some of the buttons on the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A button, so at any point during today's presentation, feel free to ask a question. We'll do our best to answer it during the webinar. And if there's not time to answer it during the webinar or you're watching it on replay, we'll be sure to answer that question for you. Be sure to check out the resources tab because all of today's resources will be listed in that box there. Again, on behalf of the Pedavon system, welcome to the webinar. We hope Hey, everybody, how you doing? I am Dr. Chris Cohen. I'm in Gig Harbor, Washington. Um, I have private practice, but I've been a Pedabon guy since before I graduated from chiropractic school. It's been that many years ago. Uh, I won't tell you. You can look it up. Um, we're going to talk today a whole lot about the therapeutic wobble chair. Uh, it's one of my favorite tools in the office, and we're just going to kind of dig into all the whys, the hows. Um, we'll have some video on how to use the thing, when we use it, when it makes the most sense, what our goals are, and, and we'll just kind of take you through everything that you're going to need to know about this thing um, so that you can make it a really effective tool in your practice just the same. Um, if, you can, if you're having any issues with the video or the, the slides, please uh, let us know right away. Otherwise, I'm going to just kind of get us started. So the wobble chair, um, well, we're going to see what this thing's all about. If you've never been on it or sat on one, uh, you definitely need to get to a live class to see that, uh, get into a practice or they have them, try it out. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to use this wobble chair to produce these what we call loading and unloading cycles of the spine, right? And when we load and unload, we're going to get certain effects on the different types of tissue, whether that's the ligaments, the muscles, the joints, the discs, right? And, and, and the nervous system, obviously, in all of that, because, you know, we know that this is the primary function as chiropractors, is let's get that nerve system right. Um, what we want to see here is when we're looking at it, one of the one of the primary things that we use the wobble chair for is for the disc. And, and it's one of the only tools that will actually target a disc as well as it does. So what's the disc do? Well, if you're a chiropractor watching this, you probably have a pretty good idea already. You know, the, the disc um, is a, is a, a flexible um, hydraulic kind of a joint, right? Um, if you've ever been told it's a shock absorber, I'm going to challenge you on that one because it's full of fluid, right? Fluid doesn't really compress well, which makes it a terrible shock absorber. But what it does is it helps to transfer energy from above to the vertebra below in a nice even manner so that we can get that force transmitted. We can walk, we can move, we can bend, sit, everything we need to do. So it becomes a spacer for those vertebra. It helps to maintain the shape of the spine when the discs are healthy. And that's key when they, when they are healthy. Um, and it helps us, again, just to distribute the weight of the body evenly throughout, whether it's a lumbar disc, in this case, when we're talking about the wobble chair, we're going to be on the lumbar spine, or if we're talking about a cervical disc, when we get into the neck traction, the cervical traction, uh, they're going to really work in the same way. The difference is going to be the amount of load they're going to be under because of, you know, how much body, how much body is above that disc specifically. Um, when we talk about discs, and I mentioned a couple times, and I said, really, it's a healthy disc. Uh, a healthy disc is one that is fully hydrated, that has good edges. You can see in our pictures here, you know, we've got the, the compression when you look at it from the side. But when you look at that bird's eye view, like we slice the vertebra in half and you're looking kind of down on the thing, um, you're going to see this, that dark blue center is the nucleus pulposus, the outer rim, the layer upon layer of ligament, and that is your annular fibers, right? The annulus fibrosis, we call the annular fibers. Um, and what happens is, is if the disc doesn't get moved through its normal range of motion every single day, then that nucleus begins to break down. It begins to dehydrate, causing weakening on the outer fibers, those outer layers. And we're going to talk really like a lot about why that fits. Um, by the way, you guys are going to notice I'm not going to read the slides to you. You can see that. I'm assuming you guys are going to be all intelligent and be able to handle this. Um, if there's questions in the Q&A time, throw them at me and we got it. Okay, um, the outside part here we've already just talked about, right? So this is now instead of looking at it kind of bird's eye view, we're looking at it from the side view, but we're looking at it with it sliced in the middle. So this view here again is this nucleus pulposus. The annular fibers here is just like I said, is layer and layer and layer of, uh, of a thin ligament that's kind of just wrapped around the nucleus again and again and again to, to give it that nice uh, strong attachment. They attach to each other and they attach to the vertebral bodies above and below that disc 
So it's it's not like it's just you know like two rocks with a, with a water balloon in between them. They're actually attached on each end, um, and that's really kind of important. Uh, when we talk about the nucleus, uh, it's not just water, right? And that's kind of an important factor because um, we talk about different supplements. We talk about we're going to talk about the qualities of that disc and that nucleus of the disc here, and, and it's really important to realize then that that's not just water. It doesn't work like that. The the nucleus is actually got a, a bunch of different protein, you know, protein aggregates, right? Glucose, aminoglycans, and things like that, that thicken that fluid. So it's not really just water, it's, it's thicker than that. Um, this is why you hear people say, oh, you know, people take MSM for their joints, or they'll take glucosamine or chondroitin, is because it's not just pure water. Um, and it's those other things mixed into the water that give us part of that consistency of the nucleus that we're after. So the nucleus of the disc, when it's strong and healthy, and it is going to have this like jello-y consistency, right? It's, it's not quite so runny. Um, it's going to be a little thicker. We're going to talk about how do we make it thinner for purposes of change or purposes of imbibing more fluid. And then we're going to talk about how and why we let it cool back down into its thicker jello-like state and why that's going to be important to be done in a really specific manner. Okay? Um, important to kind of understand. So we talk about, well, okay, um, how do we get nutrients in, right? And, and we're going to talk about this because most of us think, well, nutrient comes from blood flow. And it does. But a disc is a little different. It's a really specialized kind of a, a kind of a tissue. Um, it doesn't have blood flow, right? After about the age of 12, the blood flow into the disc pulls back, it recedes out. And then the way that they get the way that they get their nutrition in and their waste product out is through movement, right? Um, you're going to see that, you know, the, the nutrients, there's the disc on this very top. You guys can see my mouse here. The, the blood vessels come really close to the edge of the disc, and then they, they kind of push nutrient in and suck waste product out, and that is dependent 100% on mobility. Motion around the joint, around the disc, is what feeds and nourishes it and cleanses it of metabolic wastes. Without movement, those things do not happen. Uh, and and this, is, this is really important, and I want you guys to really grab that concept, because without movement, it's dying, right? Uh, it's been said, you know, life is motion. We quit moving, you're dead. That's, that's just kind of how it is. The joint is no different. It's just a, big, it's just a small part of us. If it stops moving, it starts dying. If we can get it moving again, we can restore some, some fluids, some nutrients, really some life. Okay. Um, the, the disc itself, so we said this fluid isn't just water. Um, fluid, oxygen, nutrition, the, the things that are going to cause it to change without that blood flow is this. So in the very first slide I mentioned this loading and unloading, this pressure change, right? Um, if you think about it, like if you're washing your car and you take a sponge and you put it on the bucket of water and you, you wash your car a bunch and then you, you look at your sponge and say, man, this is nasty. You throw it on the bucket of water and you don't just let it sit there a while. You actually push it into the water and then you squeeze it out, right? And you put it back in the water and you squeeze it out a couple of times and it takes that change in pressure, the squeeze and the release and the squeeze and the release to cleanse the sponge and the disc and the joints here are going to work the same way. So this is what we call a loading. This is why we call it a loading and unloading. We load it with pressure and then we unload it. With the spine, it's almost loaded and then unload is really what we're after. Um, and I say that because we're really, we're almost constantly loaded. If you are vertical, you're being loaded by gravity all the time. It does not ever take a break. And a lot of people want to say, oh, gravity's terrible. It wears us out. It doesn't really, it's just doing its thing. If our, if our spine is well managed and well taken care of, gravity isn't a problem. It's actually a benefit for us. That's a whole, whole other you know, lecture series. But basically, gravity is not our enemy. Gravity is just gravity. How we respond depends on how well we've taken care of our spines and how well we've managed things. So when we look at this, at this disc metabolism, compression, decompression, right? Load and unload, load and unload. And that's really, uh, really what we're after. Um, when you do these loading and unloading cycles, 
we get this this thing called hysteresis, right? And the, the hysteresis is the holding power of the ligamentary disc. So the more we do, the, the, the more that hysteresis is going to change, the, the, light, the less the holding power is going to be of that disc. And, and this kind of becomes important when we're talking about making a change in the spine because ligaments and discs are extremely powerful when they're not injured as far as helping us to maintain position. So if we're going to change position, then we use those loading and unloading cycles to help soften and make the change possible. Uh, the other part of it becomes, like you can see in our pictures, you know, you get the flexion, extension, bending, bending, rotation. All of these things create motion in different areas of the disc at a time. It's not the entire disc is loaded or the entire disc is unloaded uh, on a wobble chair. It's done in sections and pieces. So we have these different, the different movements that we need in order to accomplish all portions of the disc. Okay. Um, when we get this back and forth, back and forth, right, front to back or side to side, whatever it is, you kind of see here what happens is one side loads, one side unloads. Then we switch and the other side loads, right? So it's, it's this alternating back and forth. That's that teeter-totter effect, right? Um, what happens is, and, and we'll probably talk about this a couple of times because people say, well, but what about a ball? Couldn't I do these exercises on a ball? Well, you can exercise your spine on a ball. Yes, absolutely but you're not going to affect the disc the same way. The reason that the wobble chair works so effectively on the disc, if you see this thing called this axis of rotation, right, it's a pivot point. And if I'm going to move and pivot, and I want to affect the disc, then my pivot point has to be no larger than the nucleus of the disc itself. If it's bigger, then I'm not getting a movement about that axis. So if I'm on a ball, and I'm moving back and forth in a similar manner to like I'm on the wobble chair. I go, well, okay. And I was at a lecture and a guy says, you know, if I'm on a wobble chair, if I'm on a ball, it's the same thing. And uh, he was not a Pettibon guy. He clearly, you know, he didn't get the, the difference. Uh, it looks the same. Looks the same, but it's just not. It's not the same thing because on the ball, that pivot point is huge. It, it's the size of my backside. You're going to move and everything goes this way. You're not impacting the disc at that nucleus because your pivot point needs to be right there. It's small. So when you look at the wobble chair, the way that it was developed was keeping that fact in mind. So you say, well, hey, if I'm going to wobble on a wobble chair, my pivot point now, it is the size of my disc, of the nucleus of the disc, not the whole disc even. So I'm going to get this response in that nucleus that I'm not going to get on a ball going to get on a cushion or a disc or a foam pad or anything else. It doesn't work the same way. Okay, so what we're going to be doing here is when we say wobble chair exercises, really it's first we're going to stretch a little bit. We're going to stop the, or we're going to start the, the softening and the warm-up of the tissue, the muscles, the ligaments, everything's just going to stretch out a little bit. So we're going to just start with a little easy stretching. And then what we're going to do is we're going to combine this front to back and side to side motion into a single motion that kind of makes like a figure eight. So if you watch the pelvis when a person walks or moves, the pelvis kind of, we don't really just do this straight twisting movement and the pelvis doesn't do this straight up and down thing. It kind of does an in-between where you get a little up and forward and the other side naturally is down and back and then it switches. So we're getting this constant here and then the next, oh look, there's this, there's this figure eight movement, right? Um, and that's the combination of front to back with side to side movement. That's what we call the figure eight, or some guys will call it an X pattern, or something. You know, there's different names. I don't really care. I tell people in my office, look, we're going to do this pattern, and this is what you need to do because the couple of points of it is this is the normal motion of a pelvis during a brisk walk, and we have to take this. And obviously, you say, well, wait a minute, my pelvis doesn't move like that crazy. No, it doesn't, but we have to rehab it. So we're going to accentuate those motions a little bit so that when I am just walking, I have already established my ability to do those normal movements. The, the wobble chair itself then, once we get past some of the outer layers of tissue, the muscles and some of those outer ligaments, we start getting into that inside and having that really powerful effect in the disc. And what happens is, so earlier I said, hey, you know, it, it's kind of thick like jello. Um, that thick, jello-y state is what we call a hydrogel. When you 
exercise this. You move it front to back, side to side, circles, X gel, you know, X pattern, figure eight pattern. All of these things take and they create some friction. They create some movement and some heat in that disc. And what ends up happening is it takes that, that gel-like state and it softens it. It makes it a little bit more fluid, right? Um, we go from what we call the hydro gel, like the jello, to the hydrosol, which is kind of like the jello before it's had time to cool down and set, right? I mean, we know we make jello by packet of, of this, the, the stuff, you know, the colors and the sugar and whatever, you dump it into the bowl and you put in your hot water and you dissolve it in. And then you put your cold water in and it begins to thicken and you stick it in the fridge until it's completely gel like. And that's jello. So when we do the wobble chair, what we're doing is we're actually trying to reverse that process going from that cold jello. We're going to actually start taking it back through into that fluid state. The more fluid it is, the easier it is for those nutrients to exchange, the waste products to exchange in and out, uh, increasing the health of our disc. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So you know, everything on this slide, I think I've already talked about. Well, I talked about the first set, right? We, we get the, the hydration, we get the nutrient delivery, waste elimination, right? Discs, ligaments, cartilage, joints. Um, you also, while you're doing the same movement, um, the CSF, right? The cerebrospinal fluid is what feeds and nourishes our brain, specifically in spinal cord. Um, I'm kind of kind of like my brain being fed. So when we're doing this wobble chair and this movement, it actually is going to increase the circulation of that CSF, um, which means uh, you know, you're, you're going to feed your brain better, you're going to be able to think clearer, you're going to heal faster, I mean, all the cool benefits, right? Um, and, and that's kind of an important deal for, for brain health. Um, so here's, the, here's kind of the diagram. We call it a figure eight. Some offices, if you see this kind of pattern here in the middle, uh, some people will call it the bow tie. Um, you know, everybody's going to call it what they want. It doesn't really make much of a difference. When I'm teaching a patient how to, how to use the wobble chair, you know, I kind of tell them, I say, look, you're sitting in the middle of a box, and you're going to use the corners of the box. So you're going to, you're going to push your pelvis front right into position one here, and then you're going to go straight back on the same side. That's position two. You only cross the center line when you're doing the forward movement at the diagonal. Uh, so there's three, and then you go straight back again. There's four. And I say, and that's all there is to it. It's just a four count, and then you just repeat it an awful lot of times until you get the results you're after. And it does the job. If you do it, it works. Um, I'm going to throw this out there because somebody's going to ask, and I get this in clinic all the time. People say, well, that, that's this isn't that hard. When do I get to do something that's hard? I never said it was going to be hard. I just said it was going to fix you. Um, the, the power in the wobble chair is not how hard you can push or how far you can force your spine. It's the repetition that gets the job done. Uh, when we get to the traction unit, we'll talk about the same thing. It, it's not about how hard you can do it. In fact, how hard is generally not that good for you. Um, if you're pulling so hard that it's causing pain or discomfort, it, it isn't helping. So with the wobble chair, the idea is, can I do enough repetition to get the response of the tissue that I want without increasing pain? And when you do this, like you can see in the picture here, Brianda's smiling the whole time. Uh, that's not just because she's acting it feels good. You get on the wobble chair and you're just kind of like, ooh, this is super nice. And that's what it should be after you've broke, you know, gotten, gotten through some of the scar tissue and some of the, the adhesions, some of the things that have to kind of be loosened up in order to move. Uh, and that happens. Even this morning I had a patient that turned to a brand new patient on the wobble chair. and It was really a little uncomfortable. And she says, I used to hate this thing. She says, I thought it was so uncomfortable. She says, and now I feel so good. I stretch really like, Jesus, my, my muscles and everything stretches so much better that I actually push myself a little bit so I can make sure I keep improving. And she says, I, I love it now. She says, and I hated it to begin with because it was just uncomfortable. So it, it works. It was kind of one of those unexpected testimonies. Um, when we do this, this pattern, right, so I tell people a couple things. The movement is one thing. The coordination of the movement with the breathing is another thing. When we are doing this pattern, we want the full, deep, deep, deep diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing is where you know the diaphragm muscle sits here between the, between the chest and the abdomen, and when you inhale, that muscle flattens down, and when you exhale, it relaxes back up to its resting position. So when we go to these forward positions, and if I push myself kind of front right here like I'm on a wobble chair, I take that inhale, and I'm pushing the diaphragm down as hard as I can. It's going to 
open the lungs, create a bigger vacuum, and help me suck more air in. When I push back, and I round my back, I let it stretch the back out, and I exhale all the way, I'm pushing the air through, pulling in, pushing out. The diaphragmatic breathing is one of the keys of the wobble chair that helps to really make it what it is. Um, do you guys probably aware of the central tendon, right? It's the one that, that the, the heart sac, the pericardium, has this tendon that runs down and it connects to your diaphragm muscle. When you pull on that central tendon with the diaphragm taking the deep breath, it takes the pericardium and it gives it a little, a little just tightens it in around the heart. Well, if I take any other muscle in the human body and I squeeze and relax and I squeeze and relax, most places you're going to go, gee, that's a nice massage. Well, we know massage is good. It feels good. It's good for the muscles, good for circulation. So if you're doing the wobble chair with deep diaphragmatic breathing, you're going to actually have a direct effect on your cardiac muscle. Not just the cardiovascular system, but the muscle itself. Hugely, hugely important. Right, and there's you can pull study after study on the benefits of oxygenation and deep breathing, all those things. But this is really one of those powerful tools to accomplish it. Okay, um, soft tissue. So people, this is the other one I get. Right, you guys see the title in this slide. Why do I have to wobble in the clinic? I got a wobble chair at home, doc. I'm fine. <sighs> okay, so here's how this works. If I'm going to adjust somebody, if I'm going to do a decompression on somebody, if I'm going to do the weights on somebody, if I'm going to do anything with a patient that comes through my door. One of the things I'm going to be looking for is how stiff or how rigid are those tissues? Am I going to be fighting with the patient or am I going to be working with the patient? So when somebody says to me, well, doc, I just wobble at home. Um, I think I'm okay. I don't, I don't really need to wobble. I, I wobbled this morning. It's my favorite, right? It's like it's four in the afternoon. I wobbled this morning, doc. Um, what you want to realize is, is that those those disc spaces, right? We're trying to get them to go to a hydrosol from a hydrogel. We want to make them fluid-like instead of jello-like. Um, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes for them to cool back down and become jello-like again. Okay? And that's not a problem. That's just the physiology. We want to, when we work on somebody in the office, like I said, whether you're adjusting, whether you're decompressing, whether you're just supervising them doing their weights, whether you're you know, test it. Whatever you're doing with the person, I don't want to fight those tissues. I want them to be cooperative for me. So if they if they say, "Oh, doc, I just wobbled. How far do you live from here? It's been more than more than ten minutes. Let's do a few minutes and loosen. You know, get those tissues back into the pliable state that we want. Um, I generally will not let somebody get away with that. Otherwise, it's like, no, 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 no. Let's let's do the job all the way. Let's get the job done. You know, Dr. Broly's call it half step, and he says, you know, let's, let's do this all the way. I don't, I don't want to short, short change anybody. I want them to get the full results. And, and that's a super important portion of this thing. Um, I talked about all of this one, right? So I, I told you guys I don't like to read slides. Uh, central tendon attached to the heart. Diaphragm contracts down. We, we talked about this. There's some other fun facts you guys can look up there. Um, Deep breathing, right? Chest breathing versus belly breathing. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, there's a study done that they did 153, I believe it was, uh, people that had heart attack. Every single one of them, chest breathers, right? As opposed to deep diaphragmatic breathing, whether that was directly because of the central tendon effect or not, they didn't say in their study specifically, but I don't know that I want to take much of a chance. I'm going to be a belly breather. Uh, the wobble chair is one of those great ways of doing it. I often joke with my patients. Um, I say, you know, your wobbling looks great, but let me teach you how to breathe. And, and they often kind of look at me like, what, what are you talking about? I'm breathing. I say, well, yeah, you, but you're doing a terrible job of it, right? Let's get you breathing well so that you get the maximum effectiveness of this. And this is where I kind of give them a little, here's how you do the breathing. Here's how the body should move. The belly, the, the chest should not really come up and down with diaphragmatic breathing. Right, you guys, chest breathing happens when you're at maximum exertion. You're in an athletic event. You're being chased by a bear. I want every every ounce of, of oxygen I can suck into my body. But when I'm just walking, moving, living life, I shouldn't have to be doing all of that. It should be diaphragm, lower half of the body, lower the abdomen expands a little bit, the lower portion of the rib cage, but the chest shouldn't be up and down, up and down, right? Um, and that's the diaphragmatic stuff, right? Uh, 
I talked about this one already, right? Why can't I just use the ball? Well, you can use a ball. You're going to exercise the muscles. You're going to have a great time, but you're not going to affect the disc. You're not going to get you're not going to get all of the results that you should be able to get from the time spent. Um, if if the only difference between the time you're spending is I'm sitting on a ball or sitting on a wobble chair, why not just sit on the one that's going to get you all the results instead of part of them? Okay, um, that's that explanation I gave you earlier, right? So here it is. The oh, this one, great slide, right? So here's. When we're putting people on the wobble chair, and when we get to the portion where we're actually demoing the chair, uh, I'll show you this. But basically what you want to look at is when I'm sitting here, uh, if these are my legs and the floor is here, right, or if here's my legs and the floor is down here, um, I want to make sure that a couple of things. One, um, the hips need to be higher than the knees. I don't want to have a, I don't want to have a reversal from my, my knees being higher than my, my hips. That's going to put my lumbar curve into a reversal and I'm going to end up injuring myself real easily, really fast. It just does not feel very well. Um, so when I set people up on the wobble chair, when I'm wobbling, it's hips are either at or slightly higher than the knees, um, and all the wobble chairs are fully adjustable, so that, that makes it really easy. The other one you'll see is, you know, you got this, uh, the three corners of the wobble chair. You know, the, the one corner that doesn't match the other two, so to speak, that's kind of the center, like the home plate. I tell people, you know, you kind of face, face the front of the home plate for it. Um, and and that was it. So I mean, the, the chair has been developed to make it real comfortable to sit on and, and to move correctly as long as you get it positioned right. Okay. Um, who uses a wobble chair? This is one of my great ones, right? So um, who goes to the dentist or who should go to the dentist, right? Um, who should have their teeth cleaned? Anybody with teeth that wants to maintain them should have their teeth cleaned. Um, who should exercise? If you're a living human being, you should exercise every day, right? That's just part of normal health. Um, so who should be on a wobble chair? Well, if you have a spine and you'd like it to last you for your entire lifetime, you should be on a wobble chair. If you've got an injury, you may have to shorten your movement. You may have to tighten things in a little bit. You may not simply be able to move as far as you should uh, simply because of pain and injury. When that happens, I tell people, I say, look, you just work to your comfort zone. If you go complete range of motion to one side and the other side, you go, man, I can't go any further. This hurts. Say, then stop there, right? We're not trying to kill somebody. Don't force through it, but take it right to that edge of pain where you go, man, I, if I go any further, this is really going to hurt. Perfect. Stop right there. Go to the other side. Come back to it right to the edge of pain. What will end up happening, and I, I don't even mention this to most people, I just let them experience it, um, that movement, that movement stimulates the healing. So, you know, I had a patient on a wobble chair, and she's moving like this, and every movement was painful. And she says, Doc, this really, this hurts. I said, tighten your movement, don't go quite so far. I said, but just give me five more minutes. Don't you have to do the whole thing, just give me five minutes. I came back by five minutes later, and I said, How's, how are you doing on the wobble chair? And she says, man, Doc, this still, this is really, really unpleasant. And I said, okay, well, just try five more minutes for me. Just give me the five. And so I came back five minutes later, and, and I said, well, how are you doing in this movement? She didn't realize it, but her movement was getting bigger. And I said, well, how do you feel now? She says, you know, it still really hurts when I get to this end range of movement here. And, I, you know, I get to this part, and it really hurts. I said, okay, well, notice the difference. And I said, you were starting off, and you were moving like, you know, you're almost just tilting on the chair now you're moving all this all this full range of motion look at how big your spine movements are and the patient stopped and looked, kind of looked down and watched wobbling and said hey how did that happen I said, well because you're doing the exercise the right way you're not forcing through the pain you take it right to the edge and the movement itself is healing movement is life right so move as far as you can comfortably go each direction stop when you have to and you get uh, right there. That movement will increase your pain-free range of motion. It, it, it just does every time, right? It always does. Um, when we use the wobble chair, so when I tell people what, what's the benefit, right, or what's the, the instruction to get the most benefit, at home you want to do your wobble chair exercises twice per day. First thing in the morning, have a nice big glass of water, if you guys are doing the real salt or the Himalayan crystals, you know, those kinds of things to start loading the system. Um, here's a here's a tip. People say, man, I tried taking glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM, um, but it didn't help. My back still hurts. Well, think back to what I said here a few minutes ago. 
in order to get nutrients into those disc spaces, they have to move. If I take a supplement like MSM, glucosamine, chondroitin, hyaluronic acid, whatever, and I go and I take the supplement and I sit on the couch waiting for the supplement to work, it's not going to work ever. If I take the supplement that I need to get into the disc and then I move the joints around the disc, I'm going to imbibe fluid and imbibe the nutrients with that new fluid, and I'm going to get the results I was after with those supplementations, whatever you're doing. Um, so every morning, every evening, right, we do the we do the wobble chair exercises. I tell them in the morning, you're gonna you're just gonna get your body moving. I mean, you've been laying all night long, you haven't moved. You want to get some movement going. You want to get the tissues going. You get the blood flow happening. They're going to just warm up and soften. I mean, how many people don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, man, I need that stretch first thing in the morning? Well, of course you do. You've been static all night. So you get up in the morning, you do your stretch, get on the wobble chair. Let's make it a fully effective use of the time. Um, you we're going to do those every time before we put on the waiting system. And then when we do the evening, we're going to do kind of the same thing. Before you do the weights, before you do spinal molding, before you do any of the other procedures, you want to reduce the holding energy of those ligaments so that they can really give you the response and the change that you're after. Um, in the clinic, we do the wobble chair and the traction unit. Prior to, like, I want to adjust somebody. If, they're, if they say, oh, I don't have time for the wobble chair. I say, you don't really have time for today's visit. Let's reschedule you. Uh, I don't want people to have a bad experience in my office. And I just find over the years that if I adjust somebody cold, it's just not that pleasant. It doesn't feel that good. Uh, I want my adjustments, you know, it's like, yes, we understand it's more than about just pain. It's about nervous systems function and getting, but it can be a good experience. And this is one of those ways that I can just kind of help ensure, hey, look, this is going to be a good experience. If you do your part, I'll do my part. Um, after doing the, the, after getting adjusted or decompressing in the office, uh, I can put the weights on somebody and one of the options I have for them to have an activity with the weights on, go back, go hop back on a wobble chair. Uh, they do make the vibration platform that's extra large that has a notch cut into it so you can put your wobble chair on it and then they're able to get whole body vibration with the wobble chair exercises. Very cool technology. A lot of fun to try it. Um, if you haven't, you should. It's a blast. But it's also super, super effective. Okay. Um, just before the spinal molding, right, so you guys see how if you haven't learned how to do spinal molding, it's coming soon. I promise you'll see that. The fulcrums here are about reshaping the neck, but if your ligaments are cold, they're not really going to reshape, they're not really going to restretch. Okay, um, so we use the wobble chair in the morning, we use it in the clinic before any procedures are done with them, and then at night you can use that wobble chair to prepare your soft tissue, prepare the ligaments and the discs for doing your spinal molding. Again, we're going to turn the disc and that space in from a hydrogel, from a jello like, into a much more fluid state. The hydrosol state, and then you put the you get on your molding so that it can help uh, help cool them back down. Basically, you're just cooling back off, but in the new shape, right? You're you're taking that spine and you're making it like the Jello mold, and then you're just giving it the spinal molding is the specific shape we want for that molding effect. Okay. Um, the next slide I'm going to click on for you guys here uh, actually is a little video, so I'm going to shut my camera off so you're not staring at me staring at a video. Um, It'll take you take us a few minutes. We'll go through like here's how to wobble, here's adjustments on the chair. I'm just gonna kind of give you the, the the full deal on the wobble chair itself and show you how to use it. When it's finished, I'll come back on and, and we'll finish up this webinar. So in this section, I'm gonna talk about when to wobble and how to wobble. The when is actually kind of easy. So on a normal daily basis, we're going to wobble twice every day on the minimum. So I like morning and evening is the best because there's other uh, home exercises, for example, we give to the patient and this becomes one of them, but it's also going to be further prepping for their head weighting that they're doing at home. Uh, when they do the wobble chair, we're going to look, ask them to do between 8 and 15 minutes. Um, what, what Dr. Pettibon found was it's 120 cycles, these loading and unloading cycles. We're going to talk about that more in another video. Um, what we talk about is 120, and I got kind of tired of trying to figure out like what number was I on because I'm moving and, and I was simply confused sometimes to go, forget what number I was at. So we just timed it a couple of times over and we found if you're moving nice and slowly, it might take 15 minutes. If you're moving a little quicker, you could go as, as much as eight. Uh, but when we talk about the how to do the wobble chair, you're going to kind of see how that all fits together really easily.
Before I actually get to it, let me kind of give you the tour. The wobble chair has adjustable arms on both sides. The seat is hydraulic, the little handle here. If you're not weighed on it, then it comes up. Uh, the chairs, you know, tell people, sit down, feet should be able to reach the floor comfortably. Hips should be at or slightly higher than the knees. You don't ever want your hips below the knee level when you're on the wobble chair. That just becomes very painful very quickly. Um, every, t every time you move up on the wobble chair, so the other thing, if you, if you have a disc that you want to target that's a little bit higher than L5, for example, about every inch or so that you move the wobble chair up above the, the hips above the knees, you end up moving up about one disc level for its main focus, um, main target, right, main focus of, of effect. Um, doesn't mean you're not going to hit all of them anyway, but you can really kind of target really nicely if you want to get really specific with it. Um, when we do the wobble chair, so there's a couple of things to do. Uh, there's a set that we kind of refer to as the warm-ups, and that's really going to be kind of stretch, let the head, let the spine whole thing move front to back. We've got side to side, right? Change positions. You can change where your spine pivots by raising the arms here and here even with a little gentle push into the head, right? Not crazy aggressive, we don't want to hurt anything, we want to stay within pain thresholds, and then even a twist where we just sit and turn behind us, and the challenge on this one, you're like, well, the wobble chair isn't moving, but that's kind of the challenge in and of itself. It's unstable, you have to really work to stabilize. Right, and then there's the actual, um, the actual exercise, right? The, the therapeutic value, the, the why do we want this wobble chair beyond the ball or the, the, the discs or the other things that we've talked about. And so there's there's different ways of explaining it. Some people will say it's like a, a figure eight or a bow tie or an X pattern or kind of a, however you want to describe it, right? It's whatever fits the best into your vocabulary is kind of the easiest. So the idea, and like when I explain it to a patient, I tell them, you know, you pretend you're sitting in the middle of a box. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push my pelvis to the front, say right corner of the box and then I'm gonna to push to the back right corner of the box. So I kind of stay on that same line, and then I cross over the center line when I go to the front left corner, and then I go front left to back left, and then I cross over to front right, so there's how I kind of get my X concept. If you smooth it out, then it kind of becomes more of a figure eight, like a sideways figure eight, or a, you know, the bow tie kind of a thing. Um, however you wanna explain it, however you wanna think about it that makes it easy, totally up to you. <clears throat> when I do it, like I said, I use the box analogy, you're sitting in the box, you're going to push the pelvis, and what you're going to do is the I guess just kind of start patients and start people on it with just the ease of the movement, right? Just kind of move and stretch, and then round the back, right? And I want people to just kind of get a feel for it before I throw everything at them. So once they've done a couple of repetitions this way, they're moving, they're doing okay with it. I say now the the key here is not just to move, but is to one deep breathe. You got to get the diaphragm involved. Two, you have to keep your head centered over your spine. And then three, you really kind of have to think about how much arch and bend can I put into my spine, right? So if I'm gonna show you the right way, and then I'll show you a couple of things that I see when I see people doing it not quite right so that you can kind of know what to look for. Um, and that'll just kind of help make it easier when you're teaching it or if you're just watching to do it yourself, then you'll know kind of like, okay, what do I wanna not do and what do I really wanna do? So as we move, I'm gonna go front right, I'm gonna tip my pelvis that direction, and I'm gonna inhale really deep. And then I push back and exhale all the way out. Every forward movement is an inhale. Every back movement, full exhale. I even tell some people when they're having a little harder time with just the, the movement and the breathing, almost think about like your solar plexus right at the tip of your sternum here. And I'm going to lift it straight up. There's my inhale, the inhale expands the rib cage. <sighs> Exhale and I squeeze, actively contracting everything in. When I inhale, that diaphragm, that dome muscle pulls down nice and firm. <sighs> and then all my other abdominal muscles squeeze the air out. I always joke with my patients to tell them extra points, you know, brownie points if you breathe like Darth Vader. <laughs> you gotta have fun with it. It's okay to have a good time. <laughs> All right. I do have fun. Inhale, exhale, 
deep breath, use the diaphragm, pull it all the way down, exhale, squeeze with the abdominals all the way out. Okay, you'll now you'll notice a couple of things. My goal is to keep my head right over my chair the whole time. What the rest of my spine does is gonna be a natural result of that position being correct. So here's a couple of things that I see. So if you're teaching somebody or if you're watching, if you're doing it yourself and you have anybody to watch you, put up a camera and videotape yourself, put your selfie stick up there and just do a quick recording. When people move the head and they're doing this kind of a thing, right? A couple of things will happen. One is they'll grab the handles of the wobble chair and every time they lean back, they feel like they're gonna fall over so they white knuckle here. And that's one of my first indicators that somebody's not doing something right, is that their knuckles turn white from gripping as hard as they can on a wobble chair to keep from falling over backwards. Uh, what we really want, if my, if my head doesn't stay over the chair, then I'm really doing this as I'm on the wobble chair, and you notice there's just no movement of my spine. If my head stays still and my pelvis is now moving, my spine has no choice but to go. And that's exactly what we want. And the more the head stays still, the further up the spine will actually move until this wobble chair becomes not just a low back tool, but it begins to work its way all the way up the spine. I get somebody with neck pain and I'll put them on a wobble chair and they do 10 minutes on the wobble chair and they get up and I say, how's your neck pain? They say, well, how did that work? How did that, how's my neck pain better from, from doing this low back exercise? It's, well, it's really one spine, it's not low back. Okay, so the, the upper body movement is one of the biggies that I see first thing people kind of do in this one. The other one is they don't breathe. And they do this kind of thing where it's really quick movements and they're not tying their breathing and their movement together. So a couple of things we know happening, they're not engaging their diaphragm. If you don't engage your diaphragm, then your lumbar curve is not going to restore as quickly or as easily. You're not gonna breathe as well, you're not gonna heal as quickly, you're not going to get out of pain as quickly. So the breathing does play a huge part of this exercise to be done all the way. So full movement, deep breathing, and keep that head nice and stable over the center of the chair. Uh, some people I've even had to, to just modify how they're doing their wobble. I turn the seat sideways, and I'll have them do it this way, holding on in the center with both hands. Same thing here as if my feet are, if I'm facing the front this way. Um, it doesn't really make any difference. It's, it's just a comfort level for the patient, right? Um, as we're doing that movement, you, you might have noticed like my leg kind of comes up. Um, I don't lift the leg, right? Some patients kind of see that and then they start like, oh, how hard do you have to lift my leg? You don't. It's underneath my thigh and as my chair moves back, it kind of presses up on my thigh and my foot just naturally comes up. So I tell people, don't worry about the leg. Just plant them on the ground and whatever happens with the feet happens. Uh, it, it's just no big deal, okay? So what we're doing here, we talked about, so this isn't really just a warm-up. This is really about the discs, the joints, uh, the soft tissues of the spine all being rehabbed correctly, right? So this goes beyond, uh, I'm doing a warm-up, and this gets into actually what, what the, the CPT, the chiropractic procedural terminology, uh, code books are gonna call therapeutic exercise or therapeutic activity. Um, the codes themselves are set by the description, not of the tool you're using, but what's your goal of, of using this tool, right? So if you're working on range of motion, flexibility, and strength, then it's gonna fall under a code called therapeutic exercise or therapeutic activity, depending on if you're restoring a functional goal, therapeutic activity, if you're working with a doctor direct, or doctors if you're working with a patient directly one-on-one. -on -one. Therapeutic exercise is really just the strength, flexibility, and range of motion in general. Uh, if you're focused more on, boy, I need to get this person's balance, I need to get their posture right, that's gonna fall under the code called neuromuscular re-education. Um, same tool, different outcome assessment, different code is gonna be appropriate. There's no one code that's like, this is it. There simply is, what is your, what is your chart know? What is your exam finding? And then are you stating your goal is to improve somebody's balance or are you stating you're trying to make somebody more flexible? If you're trying to make them more flexible, then don't build a neuromuscular re-education, that's therapeutic exercise. Um, if you're trying to get their, their balance better, and you're saying, man, this is an unstable platform, I'm working on their balance in a sitting or a standing activity, obviously this one's sitting, then that's gonna be neuromuscular re-education. So you really don't pick your code based off of the tool, but based off of what's your therapeutic goal. Um, unfortunately, there are some insurance companies that are so biased uh, against some of the different tools that are available to us that we find 
really there's no reason to even mention the name of the tool in the coding, right, in my charts. I just say, here's my goal, here was the patient's loss, here's what I'm trying to accomplish, and then as I've accomplished it, I simply document that we got the job done. I want their range of motion better, I want their strength better, I want their flexibility, uh, or I want their balance to improve, and I have different ways that we can test that. Um, and as long as I can show that I did my job using these tools, then we pick the most appropriate code depending on what our, our therapeutic goal was. So in the clinic, we have people start on their on the wobble chair uh, on their first treatment day. And I say first treatment day because on day one, I, in my office, we generally do the evaluation uh, and some diagnostics. But once we've arrived at a, at a care plan and the patient is accepted and we've accepted the patient, then this becomes one of the first tools that they get taught. We also have the portables in the, in the office that we send home with people. Um, I mentioned this one before here. This is the portable wobble chair. Uh, the wobble mechanism is exactly the same as on the, the full-size wobble chair. It just doesn't have the arms and the legs. They're pretty light, uh, which is super nice, and we send these things home with the patient pretty quickly. Um, obviously, people are people. There's going to be some variation, but most of the time we want these guys home with people right away. Uh, we're going to ask them to do the morning and the evening in addition to when they're in the clinic. Uh, the other thing that happens is some people will come in here and they'll say, oh, Doc, I just wobbled at home, so I'm going to skip my wobble chair when I get to the office. Um, doesn't quite work that way. The, the soft tissue portion of it that we need to be flexible and pliable for the adjustment uh, and for the weights really to do their job fully, uh, that portion of the tissue cools down. It goes from a, from a hydro gel, real soft, to a hydrosol. Um, I think I just said that backwards. Hydrosol to hydrogel, right? Goes the other way. Um, but it gets softer, gets firmer when it cools down, right? That's just kind of how the tissues work. But uh, so when somebody says, you know, oh, I wobbled at home or I did my traction at home, uh, and that was just, you know, I say, well, how long ago has it been? Oh, well, you know, it's been 15 minutes. They say, your ligaments are all cold. Everything isn't going to be not happy. Um, give, me a, give me a nice warm up. And what they'll find is it probably won't take them a full 15 minutes or whatever to warm up. They'll just do it in a little bit, a little bit of time. But I always, 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 always do a soft tissue preparation before somebody gets the adjustment, before somebody does their weights. Uh, if they don't do those things, the, the adjustments just get to be a little bit more uncomfortable. The results generally aren't as, as satisfying for both me or the patient. So every visit, wobble chair, traction unit, PTLMS if they're in that stage, adjustments, and then weights. And, and that kind of constitutes a full visit. And it's, it's not as much as people think it is time-wise. It's just kind of easy. Uh, and I just tell them plan for Hey everybody, so I hope that video was super insightful for you, gave you some answers, um, clarified exactly how this stuff is done. Um, we're going to hit the end of this uh, this webinar and we're going to touch some Q&A for you guys. Uh, before I do that, uh, I'd like to just kind of draw your attention here. Uh, you know, this information needs to be out there. People need to hear this stuff, right? Anybody with a spine needs to know how to wobble. They need to know how to take care of themselves. Um, so we're going to ask you to connect with us uh, socially, you know, you've got Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, we've we pretty much got it everywhere. Um, webinars are going to be on the, the website, they're going to be announced on some of these different channels. Um, you can also, if I don't catch one of the questions, or if I just miss you, or if you think of something later, email us in, send us over, hey, you know, what about, what about, um, and, and we'll do a really good job getting back to you on stuff pretty much as quickly as we can, okay? So I'm going to hit some of the questions here. Um, here we go. So we have a uh, question says, I, I have a patient with fusions in their lower back. Can I still use the wobble chair? Um, yes, they still can use the wobble chair. Uh, I can say that with 100% confidence because remember when I said, how do we use the wobble chair? Uh, we don't force them through anything. So if somebody says, look, this is as far as I can go, fine, it's as far as you can go. The, the ones that might be fused, um, you know, you're obviously not going to change a disc that's fused. You're not going to change a joint that's been fused. But the joints and the discs around it are pretty much taking a beating because they're having to do the extra work. So the wobble chair will actually help them to stay stronger and healthier for a longer time so that hopefully we can prevent that next, uh, prevent that, the likelihood of that next surgery. I'm, I'm sure you guys are all aware that when somebody has a lower back fusion, um, statistically speaking, the, the need for a second and even a third fusion within five years goes through the roof. It's insane numbers, right? So we do want to we do want to see it. Um, you know, we want to we want to see them help the other discs around the ones that's fused. Okay. Um, 
Patient is too short to have their thighs parallel with the floor. Um, there are low wobble chairs, so uh, they make the smaller version. There's a, a the kid size in my office. I refer to it as the uh, the Oompa Loompa size. Um, you know, I have fun with my patients. We have a good time. Um, but no, there's there's never never had anybody that was really too short to sit on a wobble chair. Um, remember the if they're short and they're sitting on the chair, that's going to simply bring their legs down further. So if I'm wanting to control the angle a little bit, if the person's really that short, I can put a couple of phone books down, right? And nothing else we're doing with a phone book these days. Get some foam blocks, get a, a Reebok step aerobics thing, get you know something that'll raise the feet up if you need to. Generally speaking, that's not been a problem. Uh, like I said, I use the, uh, the the kids' wobble chair, the Oompa Loompa size, and I've, and I've not had any problems with it. Uh, everybody does just fine. Um, this question says, I've just recently started using the wobble chair and my back seems, uh, my back seems sore. Is that normal? Uh, short answer, yes. That's just pretty much normal for now. Uh, as you're moving the joints that haven't been moved fully in a while, as the adhesions that are in there start to come loose, as any scar tissue is going to begin to be stretched and remodeled, um, yeah, it's just going to be sore for a little bit. Uh, I'll tell a patient, you know, if you're sore, go and put ice on it. Then, no, there's not really any rocket science. You guys are are fully equipped to know how to handle dealing with a patient with a little inflammation, a little soreness. Um, if you're in the office, you know, making sure you're using the the PTLMS, the Pentamon Tendon Ligament Muscle Stimulator, that'll help push some of those inflammatory exudates out and help keep that pain under control. But yeah, pretty much it's just normal. And I tell all my patients. Right from the beginning, look, we're going to move some stuff. Things are going to change. It's going to be very, very different. You may have more pain before it goes away. You're more than likely going to have soreness, right? If you go to the gym and you start a new exercise program, you're going to be sore. There's no difference. You start to move things that haven't been moved, you're going to be sore from it. It's going to ache a little bit, okay? Um I have a ruptured disc in my lower back and was told I shouldn't be wobbling. Is that correct? I don't know who told you not to wobble. Um, again, if somebody's got a ruptured disc, uh, I'm going to qualify that really hardcore, right? Because um, you're not getting, you're never, you're not going to come behind and stick your knee into somebody's back and force them through the movement that hurts. Generally speaking, almost everybody can do this, almost without exception, right? Um, if somebody is just physically in so much pain that they can't tolerate it, then you may consider, you know, you may consider doing some other therapies in the office first, but it's never really off the shelf for me, for a patient. Uh, it's the patient's like, look, you've been, you're in so much pain, you're telling me you just can't physically tolerate it. Fine, I get it. I've got other tools in the office. Um, I, I'm going to tell you, be the doctor, make that clinical decision. But what I've found over the years is that if I tell somebody, look, just try it. If you can't move, fine, sit on it for a minute. If you can't can't move much, move what you can. Uh, we know that the movement is healing. Again, use your clinical judgment, but know that in my office, it's extraordinarily rare that I do not have somebody on a wobble chair um, for any period of time. Uh, and if, if I do make that call for somebody, it, it's not more than a couple of visits, and it's okay, look, we got to get you on a wobble chair, but we're not really going to get the results that we're after here completely. Okay? Uh, is the wobble chair good for sciatic flares? Absolutely, 100%. Um, yeah, I mean, whether it's a muscular piriformis syndrome, a disc issue, a joint issue, a, whatever's going on that's causing their sciatica. I mean, obviously, sciatica is kind of a generic term. Um, you know, if, if you've de determined that there's some reason that you think they shouldn't wobble, doctor, I will leave that to you. However, uh, Generally speaking, I get somebody on sciatica, it's like, fine, get on a wobble chair, work it out, stretch it, get things moving. Again, the caveat is if, you know, you don't force through pain, right? You don't force them through a position where they say, man, I can't move any further. Come here, let me help you. Not so much, right? Um, the, you know, martial arts classes, I'm going to force somebody through it. In here, I'm trying to heal people. Not so good. We're going to take them right to the end movement, right to what they can tolerate, and just do a whole lot of it. Okay. Um, can a patient use the wobble chair while pregnant? Great question, because I get that one too, right? People are like, well, doc, I'm pregnant. Is it safe for me? 
Is it safe for you to sit? You know, if you're okay sitting, then you're okay doing the wobble chair. Um, yeah, I mean, they're they're just pregnancy isn't pathology, right? Pregnancy is a, is a state of being. It's it's not you know, oh my gosh, you have a pregnancy. It's like, hey, you're pregnant, fine. Um, yes, most pregnant women do just fine on a wobble chair. Like, same rule, two tolerance. Um, they're going to realize thing you want to the thing you want to keep in mind with a pregnant woman. And it's just kind of a general caution, right? Um, the closer they get to delivery, the more relaxant is in their system, the softer those ligaments, the more stretched they get anyway. So it's going to be a little easier for them to overdo it on the wobble chair. So I will probably scale them back a little bit. Hey, as long as that feels really comfortable, stay with it. If it's even a little bit uncomfortable as far as like, man, I feel something doesn't feel right, trust the intuition, go to, you know, pull them off of it. But as a general whole, yeah, the wobble chair is great for for pregnant women, um, you know, I've got four kids. My wife was on a wobble chair through all four pregnancies. No problem whatsoever. Okay. Uh, I have a patient with a hip replacement. Can they wobble? Yes, they certainly can wobble. Uh, the idea with a hip replacement is to increase the mobility of their hip for future use, right? They want, they want them to be able to swing the leg. So there's nothing that would prevent them to you know, say, oh, no, no, we don't want you to move your back because you have a hip. We, we absolutely want them to move their spine, move their pelvis, and, and move the hip. That's why they do physical therapy after a, after a surgery. If it's a good surgeon, they're going to say, go do a lot of therapy. Uh, it's the mobility that stimulates the healing. So, yeah, just because somebody has hip replacement, uh, knee replacement, same kind of a deal, uh, it, it doesn't make any difference to me. As long as they can go through some movement, even if they can't do the whole pattern, you're in pain, you can't do the whole thing, I get it. Do what you can tolerate, and it will improve over time. Um, like I said in the beginning, these, the wobble chair is not a power drill, it's a endurance drill, right? The longer you can do it, the more the benefits tend to come in. If you do a little bit of it every day, you're going to have a great result. If you try and hit, like, I'm going to just go crazy hard on my wobble chair, you know, once a week or once a month, it's probably not going to work as well for you. The, the secret is doing it a little bit every day, and that'll get the job done, okay? Um, doesn't look like I have any other questions for me here right at this moment. Uh, like I said, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email in. Um, you can see the, uh, the email here, webinar at pedabonsystem.com. Uh, feel free. Uh, myself or one of the other instructors will get back to you uh, through them pretty much as soon as we possibly can. Obviously, we're in practice, too, and you guys will understand that. Uh, but shoot us those questions. Uh, my office, I always put up a welcome. I mean, if somebody wants to come in and watch and see how it's done on a day-to-day, -day, um, I, I don't just teach this stuff like, oh, here's how we do it on this webinar, and then I do something different in the office. Uh, I actually do the stuff that I'm teaching right here in my office day-to-day. -day. If you want to see it, come on in and, and take some notes, um, and, and we'll just have a good time with it. Uh, thanks for being with us, and uh, like I said, anything we can do to help, please do let us know. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar. On behalf of the Pedabon system, thank you for joining us. Please follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Links to those are in the resources button. Check our social media and website for upcoming webinars. Again, on behalf of the Pedabon system, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.